You know, sexism exists. Yeah. But I've never let it deter me, to be honest. Mm. You know, it annoys me. I'll be aware of it and I'll be really, uh, really internally furious. Yeah. And then I just decide that I will meet that sexism. I will stand face to face, toe to toe, and I will crush those testicles. <laughs> And I'll keep crossing until blood is gushing between my fingers. And then I will cast them aside and move forward. I'm here in Los Feliz in LA and I'm going to be speaking with Shirley Manson of the group Garbage. During the Alterna rock boom of the 90s, Garbage was one of the scene's most popular and important artists. And at the band's heart was front person Shirley Manson, one of the most recognizable voices and faces of the era. Alongside producers Duke Erickson, Steve Marker, and Butch Vig, who at the time was best known for producing Nirvana's Nevermind, Garbage fused pop, electronica, and rock grit. They went on to sell 17 million records. Manson's always been the band's magnetic focal point, earning herself a reputation as a straight talker, a champion of outsiders, and a feminist icon. Last year, the band celebrated the 20th anniversary of their seminal self-titled debut LP with a sellout world tour. But this isn't about nostalgia. The band are back with Strange Little Birds, their first album in four years. The great thing about Shirley is she makes you feel like you're having a gossip with an old friend. So when we met up with her, nothing was off limits. So Shirley, we first have to talk about what you did this morning to prepare for our chat. <laughs> I put a face mask on, and then I started packing for Europe. <laughs> but you Instagrammed that face I mask. I did, because I looked so <laughs> ghoulish that my dog got scared and started growling at me. And I was like, wow, I can't look that bad, can I? And I looked in the mirror, I was like, yeah. Yeah. But I kind of liked it. It's kind of Hannibal Lecter look, vibes. Yeah, I look spooky. <laughs> <laughs> you are pretty active on social media. And you posted recently, private and blocking is for weak bitches. I want you to see my shit and cry. <laughs> <laughs> I've been enduring a, a, a slew of trolls. Really? Yeah. And I'm not going to let the trolls get me down, you know. I, th I sometimes think it's funny that they spend that much energy trying to mess with me. I can't. And what are they saying to you? Oh, you know, it's not even worth repeating. It's like a lot of it's physical. A lot, you're old, you're, you know, shut up. You're not pretty enough, shut up and die kind of thing. I mean, I'm not kidding. It's stuff shut like that. Shut up and die. That's a, that's a good one. Yeah. Really strikes don't at the core. talk about politics is the one that really gets me crazy. Like, you just shut up and sing. You know, you look pretty in the corner and sing. Let, leave the politics to us, you know, whoever us is. Right. Artists are people, and people should talk about politics. Right. I will continue to have opinions, and nobody's going to stop me from having them. I remember watching you on MTV and just being so struck by how cool you were and confident and sexy, but like in a kind of not overt way, <laughs> you know? No, but you were like sort of tomboyish, but you were also sexy too. And it was like a really amazing thing as a teenager to see. But it's incredible now to hear that you were not feeling confident and that was sort of this crazy facade that you managed to throw up. I'd been in a band for 10 years and I'd traveled and I knew how to perform and I knew about the record industry. And so there was a lot of confidence, but in terms of my physicality, you're right, I had none. And I was very self-conscious. I'd been thrust into this, the limelight, literally. And I really struggled to deal with the amount of attention I was getting. And I was really aware of my physicality and, and the feelings that I considered were at, at play. Mm. What was the turning point for you? How did you move past that? You know, truthfully, and this is really, really pathetic, but I don't think I really turned that corner till I was sort of 40. Wow. You know, I really struggled with it. I feel like our society's kind of tough on women and women are tough on women. When my band failed publicly, everything changes. You know, you really, really have to dig, mm. dig deep to try and pull yourself out of what you feel is this massive failure. Wait, when did the band fail? Well, when September 11th hit, it was the day that we were about to set out and promote our third record. Shit. Literally. Right. And we were due to fly out to Europe and, and everything was cancelled and, and of course the world changed that day and then all of a sudden radio wasn't interested in playing our record for the first time. You know, we'd had like literally a slew of, I think, 16 singles that all got banged on the radio all over the world. And then all of a sudden, no one wanted to touch us. 
That, that was the moment we failed and it was dark and, and you really have to do a lot of work to try and figure out, OK, where do we go now? As an artist who really made their mark on the 90s, do you think it's funny that people are now sort of fetishizing it and, like, romanticizing it like, you know, kids now? I like it. You like it? Yeah, of course I do. It's fun. <laughs> And also, the 90s was such a great period for me, you know, yeah. and, and for music. Wow, and the best. It's so lovely to hear people say that, you know, because it would have been terrible if we'd flourished in a period where everyone was like, that was a terrible, <laughs> terrible period for music. <laughs> you know, we're associated with an incredible era, and that's fantastic. But it does amuse me a little. Yeah. Yeah, because it just wasn't that cool, I can assure you. <laughs> Who were, your, who were your peers then that you are still in touch with now? Gwen Stefani would be the, the one who really I actually ended up being pals with. You know, we... Oh, you guys are cool. <laughs> so annoying. Gwen's cool. And, you know, we played a lot together. And we, have a, we share a mutual friend in Sophie Muller, the video director. Right. And so just by default, we ended up spending time together and we care about one another and I admire her. She's tough, you know, and I bump into Courtney every now and again and we're always happy to see one another. She's actually really sweet, you know, I, and I think a lot of her behaviour is defence. Mm. There's something about her, she's got a vulnerability that nobody ever talks about and it's there and she's kind and generous to people and she loves women. You know, yeah. there's a lot of women out there, I won't name names, but who are known for being, you know, women's women. Mm. And I can tell you right they're now not. they're not. But someone like Courtney, she loves women. Yeah, she, she does. doesn't. She's not. She's not unhappy sharing the room. Yeah. With other women, and I, I appreciate that. I was curious about when you came out and said that you used to cut yourself. Mm -hmm. What made you come out and talk about that at that point? When you're in that state, when you are hurting yourself, you really feel hopeless. You're in despair. Mm. for one reason or another. And I just, I guess, wanted to show people that despair doesn't last yeah. for all eternity. You know, it's just a moment. When did you start? When I was around about 13. I was done by the time I was 15. I, till this day, I'm not entirely sure what was going on, but I think there was a lot of unexpressed anger, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of hormones, and a lot of emotions that I was unable to process as a young person. But you were quite naughty as a kid. I was a wee bit naughty. <laughs> what did you get up to? I'm still a wee bit naughty. <laughs> yeah, you can see it. It's a glint in your eye. I can see it. I know. Well, naughtiness is fun, right? <laughs> I mean, I was never stupid. Mm -hmm. I never hurt anyone. And miraculously, I never really hurt myself, which really is kind of a miracle. But yeah, I, I like mischief, I guess. I read this interview with you recently where you said, culturally, people have evolved in a way that is much smarter and more talented and way more creative and accomplished than Gen X ever was. And I was curious about you clarifying that. Well, because, you know, I think we're all so arrogant to believe that evolution stops when we arrive on the planet. Right. And of course it doesn't. And when I meet a lot of young musicians in particular, they are, I mean, it's amazing how accomplished they are. I just think it's harder and harder as you get older to really fall in love the way you did when you were young. And that's why we turn into old fogies going, mm, things are not quite what they were when I was young. And I don't think it's true. Yeah. I think it's just we're more difficult to please. But you were very pleased with Beyonce's record. I was so pleased with Beyonce's <laughs> record. I thought it was incredible. I think it's a masterpiece. I really do. Yeah. Like I was kind of lovesick a little. Really? Mm. Well, it's an interesting thing with her because for so many years she was so closed and she seemed like wildly talented, but basically an automaton, yeah. you know. So it's been astonishing in the past couple of three, four years to see her move into this and really harness her personal situation. Yeah, it was fascinating, right? It's just yeah. fascinating. I mean, when she released Drunken Love, I swear this is the truth. I watched the video and I turned to my husband and I went, there's trouble in her marriage. Really? And he was like, what? just because all of a sudden she was so over, overtly sexual and yeah. like really had this attitude that like was bona fide, like badass, like you can feel it, you know? Mm. And so it's been fascinating to watch that evolution. And so when I saw Lemonade, I said to my husband, I told you, I told you this was going on. <laughs> and I'm so thrilled that she has presented a version of a universal pain for us all mm -hmm. um, with such, um, I think, courage, and also it's sort of enlightened. 
in mm. a way, the way she has dealt with this treachery. Yeah. For the first time, someone has finally eclipsed Madonna. Because up until that moment, Ooh. Madonna had done everything. And so you'd see artists come and go, and you'd be like, yeah, well, so that's great, but Madonna did it 20 years ago. And now it's like, Beyonce's done something in the pop field that Madonna has never accomplished. And God, that's so new. right. Yeah. I never even thought about it and like that. That's what makes it so exciting. It's like, whoa, okay, that, there's the evolution right there. Yeah. So I think she's arguably the greatest female artist of our generation, you know? How did you celebrate your 50th? I haven't, I haven't turned 50 yet. Oh, shit. I turned 50 in August. Okay. And I'm going to go home back to Scotland, to Edinburgh, my city, and be with my family and some of my oldest friends. How do you feel about half a century? I feel really privileged to add on another year. I, I, I'm so over people saying, oh, I don't want to be old, I don't want to be that. I'm just like, I, I haven't got no time for it. It's like, okay, well, if you want to continue being infantilized, you're going to have a really shrunken life. And yeah. that's okay, that's your choice, but don't put that on me. You know, I yeah. want to grow up, I want to keep growing up. Knowledge is power. Yes, it is. And freedom. Yeah. You know, so. Especially when you can drive your own car. Yes! <laughs> you crushed it! I crushed it! 